Okay, happy Friday on ramps, folks. Today we're going to talk about lesson 3.2 and exploration 3.2. Um, so I'd like for you to pause the video for just a little while and read through this historical note and read through this first part of lesson 3.2. So just read through this whole page and um, then we'll come back together to start working on the exploration. So pause the video for just a minute and read that. Okay, so hopefully you've taken a minute to read that historical information. Um, we're going to talk about carbon dating a little bit today and what you may have referred to in Algebra 2 as half-life. Okay, so the first part, um, just some background here, is to explain how we know that an exponential function has an inverse. So we've talked about an exponential and a logarithm being inverses of each other. Um, and so we know that it has an inverse because it's one-to-one. -one. So as you look at an exponential graph, um, exponential graphs look a little bit um, like this. This might be like a parent function of an exponential graph. Um, and because it's one-to-one, -one, we know it's one-to-one -one because it, pa it passes the horizontal line test. So because it's one-to-one, -one, that's how I know that it has an inverse. Okay, let's take a look at number two together. So in number two, they tell me that knowing the properties of inverse func I'm sorry, exponential functions um, can help us decide on some properties that should be true of its inverses. So it tells me to write e to the a is equal to l, so write that down on your paper, and that e to the b is equal to m. So write those two things down. And we want to consider that e to the a times e to the b is equal to e to the a plus b. So that's one of those exponential properties that we talked about the other day. I'm just reading right there on number two. And we want to show that the inverse of l times m is equal to the inverse of l plus the inverse of m. Okay, and you may recognize that because, again, the inverse of an exponential is a log. So you may recognize that as one of our logarithm properties, but I'm not going to jump straight into logarithms. Okay, so what I want you to think about first is the function that we're using here. So the function that we're using for this is e to the x. Okay, so when I talk about e to the a and e to the b, the function that we're using is e to the x. Okay, so I'm going to say then that f at a is equal to e to the a, which is equal to l. And so I can do the same thing with b. f at b, if I were to plug in b right there, I would be working with e to the b, which I know is equal to m. Okay, so they gave me kind of all of that information. I'm just changing up my variables just a little bit to use this function notation. And so basically I can take out these middle pieces here and I can say that I know that f at a is equal to l and I know that f at b is equal to m. Okay, so this is going to kind of lead us into that function notation using our inverses. Okay, so we know that from our problem there that e to the a times e to the b is equal to e oops, sorry, e, e to the a plus b. Okay, so using this and using what I have right here, I could say then, could be, oops, sorry, can't spell today, could be that f of a times f of b is equal to f of a plus b. Okay, so I know that e to the a is f of a, and I know e to the b is f of b, so I could say that e to the a plus b is the same thing as f at a plus b. So I could kind of transfer this also into this function notation, just like I did um, back up there. Okay. All right, so next let's start talking about this idea of an inverse. Okay, so remember that an inverse is a switching of x and y. So I'm going to rewrite this as an inverse, and so I'm going to switch what would be kind of my x right here and my y out here. So I'm going to switch these two things. So I'm going to say that f inverse of l is equal to a and f inverse of m is equal to b. Okay, so I'm going to switch my x and my y there because that's what an inverse is. Remember, an inverse is a switching of x and y. So I'm going to switch my x and my y here. 
Okay, so if I know that f of a times f of b is equal to f at a plus b, then I could say from back up here that L times M is equal to F at A plus B. Okay, so I've replaced my F at A with L. I replaced my F of B with M. Okay, so now I'm going to say that my inverse of this L times M is equal to the inverse of f, the f inverse of f, and it's going to make that go away, and I'm going to be left with a plus b. So think about that kind of like dividing it over to the other side, but we can't divide with functions. We use this inverse idea. It's kind of like when we talked about matrices. So I'm going to move this over to the other side using my inverse function there. Okay, and so now I can use what I have right back up here, and I can say that F inverse of L times M is equal to, and I know that A is the inverse of F at L, and I know B is equal to the inverse of F at M. So there we have that right there. And so what that's going to lead us into is these logarithm properties, where I can say that the log of two things multiplied together is equal to the log of one plus the log of the other. And so that's kind of where we're headed with this when we talk about this idea of inverses um, and we talk about um, logs and exponentials. So logs and exponentials being inverses of each other. Okay, so pause the video again for just a minute. That was numbers one and two on here. So pause the video again just for a minute and take a few minutes to read this inverse and the part B about this exploration. So kind of another historical note that I need for you to read there. Okay, so hopefully you had a minute to read that historical note and they gave you this formula right here at the bottom um, of this one right here. And I, know, I made a little note this summer, by the way, that colleges, when they talk about logarithms, use a lot of natural logs and e to the x. They use fewer logarithms and they use a lot of natural logs. So um, we need to get to where we're pretty comfortable using this idea of a natural log. Okay, so number three um, says, according to the definition of half-life, this formula that they've given us, half-life of the original amount of radioactive element should remain after one half of the life has passed. Okay, so half should still remain after the half-life amount of time. All right, so we're going to use this equation provided with n at t right here and set the time passed equal to one half of the life. So T is going to be equal to H. All right, so what I want to do is I want to make T be equal to H to illustrate this relationship of half of the amount remaining after the half-life. That's what a half-life is. All right, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to replace my T's with H's, and we're going to kind of see what happens here. All right, so I'm going to find N at H. So that's going to give me N sub 0 is equal to, I'm sorry, N sub 0 times E to the negative, I'm going to replace t with h, natural log of 2 over h. Okay, well I can let my h's cancel out here and here. All right, I'm also going to go ahead and try to get my exponential here by itself. Okay, so to get that exponential by itself, I'm going to divide over. So I'm going to divide over, that's going to give me um, n at h um, divided by n sub 0, oops, n sub 0, is equal to e to the negative natural log of 2. Okay, so my h is canceled out. I divide it over by my n sub 0. All right. Um, okay, next I'm going to say that I know that e to the negative ln, my e and my ln are going to cancel out. And when I bring this down to the bottom, think about this as being kind of like a negative 1 right here. Remember that I can take that and move it up into my exponent there. So I'm going to have n at h over n sub 0, my original amount, 
is going to be equal to, and I'm going to let my e and my natural log cancel out. I'm going to bring that down, and it's going to be 2 to the negative 1 power. Okay, so I just kind of got that n sub 0 out of the way for a few minutes. And so now I'm going to say that my amount, let me move that out of the way, my amount that I have n at h is going to be equal to, now I'm going to multiply this back over because I don't need it anymore, and I'm going to say 2 to the negative 1 power is 1 half. So n at my half-life is going to be half of the original amount, that n sub 0 representing my original amount. And so it does. It works out to where at half the time I have half of my original amount left. Okay, then on number 4 it says suppose that we know n and we know n sub 0 and we know h, but you would like to know the time that has passed since the specimen was alive. Describe your procedure for solving for t. Okay, so I'm going to take that same thing. They've taken out the t, so I'm just going to use n is equal to n sub 0 e to the negative t natural log of 2 to the h, I'm sorry, over h. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to manipulate these things until I can get t by itself. Okay, so you can still call this n at t if you want to. I like to just call it n because I think the n at t gets confusing. All right, I'm going to start by getting this right here by itself. Okay, so get your exponential by itself again. So I'm going to divide over by my n sub 0. Okay, all right, then I'm going to, sorry about that, I'm thundering it. All right, and um, then I'm going to take the natural log of both sides to get my e out of the way. So I'm going to take the natural log here and the natural log here. And so that's going to give me the natural log of n over n sub 0. And my natural log and my e are going to cancel out and bring all of this down. So I'm going to have negative t ln 2 over h. Okay, you can change that into the natural log of 1 half if you want to. It's completely up to you, but now I just need to solve. So I'm going to multiply over by h. So I'm going to get h times the natural log of n over n sub 0 is equal to negative t times the natural log of 2. All right, and then I'm just going to divide over by both of these. So I'm going to end up with negative h natural log of n over n sub 0 all divided by the natural log of 2 is going to be equal to t. Okay, so on that we showed our steps for solving t. And the point of that is just to know that you can move some things around um, so that you can get t by itself. Okay, the equation you found in ex exercise number 4 is the general equation scientists utilize to determine the amount of time a specimen has been dead when they know the current and the original amounts of the decaying element. All right, so use the fact that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years. So at number five, we're going to use that we know H is 5,700. Um, to rewrite the general equation you found in exercise number four. Okay, so again, take a few minutes. Video. Pause your video and try to find the, just the general equation, knowing now that h is equal. Okay, so check your answer for number 5. So again, all we needed to do on number 5 was plug in that 5700 for h back up here in my formula. So that's now what my formula is going to look like. Okay, so on number 6, now it says that a scientist finds a wooden spoon and they want to use the carbon dating to figure out how old it is. If the actual amount of carbon left is 85% of the original amount, how old is the artifact? Okay, so note here that we are actually finding the age of the wood from which the spoon was made. So maybe not necessarily the spoon, excuse me, but the actual age of the wood. Okay, so 85% is left. It started with 100%. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that n at t, what's left, or your ending amount, is 85, and n sub 0, the starting amount, was 100. So don't think too much about the percentages. Just work with it. Now we have 85 out of the 100. Okay, so plug that in. 
use your calculator. This is number six. I'm sorry. Plug that in. Use your calculator. Pause your video, and then you can check your answer with me. Okay, so check yours. Here's the correct answer right there, 1,336.452 years. Um, I also wanted to show you what I put in my calculator. So again, to make the fractions, I used alpha F1 number one to put those in just to make it a little bit easier to put into my calculator. So you can take a look at that. Okay, if you need a little bit more time, you can pause the video. Okay, your homework for tonight is just the 3.2.1 Half-Life Worksheet. Um, we'll talk about 3.2.1 Solving Exponential and Log Equations on Monday. Um, so just this worksheet, numbers one through six. And again, the answers are back here on the back. Um, I will also post um, on Schoology my work um, for these answers so that you can see that. But just this worksheet, numbers one through six, is your homework over the weekend. And again, on Monday, I'll answer any questions that you've had during the week, and we'll talk about solving exponential and log equations. Um, test over all of this is going to be on Tuesday next week. All right. Okay, y'all have a great weekend. Um, I miss you. I can't wait to see you on Monday, um, and I will see you then. Have a great weekend.